Back in 1985, I introduced this series. Uh, I went to Talmadge, Ohio, uh, needing to move from Plano, Illinois. Uh, Caterpillar, there was a Caterpillar plant there close, and most of our members were Caterpillar employees. And they went on strike. So what happens when you go on strike? Your income gets cut. And it affected the church. And so they can no longer provide my support. At the time, they were providing all my support. And for various reasons, it was decided it was better for me to go ahead and move than it was to try to get outside support. One thing, the church didn't want me preaching there and getting outside support, but that's just another story in itself. Uh, so I went over to Talmadge, Ohio. And we had a a meeting, a week-long meeting going over there talking to them. Thursday night, they decided to have what I always call roast the preacher night. I'm sure Eddie's been through them. They, they bring you up a uh, dunce chair, I guess you'd call it, or a bar stool, whatever you want to call it, to sit on, and you've got the whole congregation there, and they can ask you any question about anything they want to ask, and a lot of times questions aren't filtered. But anyway, in this case, first question I got was, has the Lord come yet or are we still to expect his return? Now that kind of, when I was asked that question, kind of threw me for a loop. I thought, why in the world is this person asking this question? And so as I researched this, well, the reason for the question, after I answered the question, I said, no, the Lord's still to return. He hasn't returned yet. And it struck me. Warren, Ohio was only about 20, 30 miles from Talmadge. Warren, Ohio, this doctrine that we're talking about tonight, the, the ones that really promoted this doctrine and really taught this doctrine were from Warren, Ohio. They had just had a young man preach for them who was the son of a prominent preacher, and you'd probably know him if I called his name, so I won't say that because that's not germane to the story, had failed hook, line, and sinker, I guess you would say, for this doctrine. And they were, having, they were having trouble with it, and finally they, they just had to ask him, you know, they just asked to ask him to leave over this doctrine. And you, you might think, well, how in the world can people get swallowed up in this thing? But believe you me, they do. People who have very strong faith and who you feel like are strong Christians, the way this doctrine is presented, before you know it, you're, you're all into it. The way they go about presenting this doctrine. And so I believe it's something that very much needs to be taught about People need to be warned about. They need to understand what the signs are of this doctrine and what is going to bring it about. Now, we think about false doctrine. We think about false teaching. There are many warnings that the Bible gives. And if you notice, first of all, in these warnings, you'll notice Acts chapter 20 and verse 29. He said, I know that after my departure, the apostle Paul is speaking, Fierce wolves will come in among you. He's talking to elders here now. Not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, elders, will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Now when you go think about that, we could, I won't spend time with, history of Roman Catholicism and the beginnings of Roman Catholicism, but it started among the eldership. If you want to know more about that, go back and you can, you can look at that. You can study that. 
how it started when a set of elders, you had a set of elders here that decide we need a head elder. We've got three elders, but we want one of them to be the head of, and, and speak for the rest of the elders. And then, okay, so then you take this location, you take this location, okay, you've got this set of elders, this set of elders, okay, let's get a man, we'll put him over these, this set of elders. You get enough of that going, now we have to add more men to this upper tier that we've added, and then finally, 606, Boniface says, I'm the papa of all these elders. Papa Pope, meaning Pope. That's where it started, Paul Warren. Now, I know that's not the lesson, so let me get off of that. I just want to give you an idea of what Paul's talking about with this, with this warning. Galatians 1, verse 6, I am astonished, Paul said, that you are so quickly uh, deserting he says, let me go down here, man, it's hard to read that far away. Um, him who called you in, grace, in the grace of Christ and are turning, here we go, to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort, watch this, the gospel of Christ. There's a warning. There's going to be some that's going to distort the gospel. And then Paul says, to even make it stronger, though even though if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed or hung on a nail, anathema. The idea there. 1 John 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Test the spirits. Compared to what the Bible says, like the lady I told you about this morning following along in the scripture till her page got blown to a different place and she thought she had found a false teacher. All it was, she had turned the page. But that's, but that's good, she was on, on guard. Realize eschatology now. What is it? Here it is. Eschatology, doctrine of last things, means the idea is entertained at any period on the future life, the end of the world, resurrection, judgment, the eternal destinies of mankind, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, Volume 2, page 979. And then, come on, there we go, realized well, if something's realized, it's what? Has been accomplished. So we have the idea that all that's happened. It's what, so that's just what the name means. Realized eschatology is a doctrine of completed things. All these things are completed. And here we go. Come on. The end times, here's the idea, the end times were realized, were accomplished in 70 A.D. This is what this doctrine says. At the destruction of Jerusalem. Destruction of Jerusalem took care of all of it, according to this doctrine. So what's it teach? It says when the destruction of Jerusalem took place in September of 70 A.D., watch this, all Bible prophecy was fulfilled at that time. You remember we talked about premillennialism had the parenthesis time, right? That, you know, they're waiting on time, the prophecy time to start up again. Realize eschatology says, no, that's not so. All prophecy stopped AD 70. There is no pro more prophecy. There is no second coming. And in their minds with this. So we'll, we'll see that as we talk further. Okay. The second coming of Christ. Here you go. All New Testament passages about the second coming of Christ. Watch this, in, and I'll show you some quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy in a minute, the book they wrote, that C.D. Beagle wrote about this have nothing to do with the actual return of Jesus for the saved. That's what this doctrine says. Now, if they come out and tell you that right off, you wouldn't accept this doctrine, would you? 
But they don't come out and tell you that. They don't come out and just right out in the open tell you that right off. Instead, all second coming passages, now listen to this, watch this, have to do with a spiritual, invisible, remember premillennialism had an invisible coming and the rapture. Now they've got an invisible coming of Jesus in AD 70 through the destruction of Jerusalem. All right? The resurrection of the dead. The resurrection does not involve the physical body. Not involved in the resurrection according to this doctrine. Instead, the resurrection of the dead actually refers to a res resurrection. Look at this. Watch this. Resurrection of the Christian system or the church from persecution inflicted by the Jews between 30 and 70 A.D. We're not talking about, see, we're not talking about a physical resurrection. We're talking about a resurrection of the Christian system because they've been persecuted, according to this doctrine. Then the day of judgment. What about the day of judgment? See what to do with that. Not a time in the future, there's not a time in the future, when all men and women will give an account to God for the deeds done in the bodies. There's not, that, that's not going to happen, according to this doctrine. Here it is. Instead, judgment day is the destruction of Jerusalem. Again, occurred AD 70. The end of the world. What about the end of the world? Well, again, here's what this doctrine teaches. It's not the passing away of the earth. According to them, 2 Peter 3.10 is wrong. It's not the passing away of the earth. Instead, it's the dissolving of the Jewish world or the Jewish system. That's what the end of the world is, according to this doctrine. Say 2 Peter 3.10. They say that's not talking about the physical world. That's talking about the Jewish world system. I put it up there because how can you get that out of that? 70 AD, doctor. Speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem, the, Jerus the Jewish system, not the end of the literal world. The kingdom of Christ, not fully established on Pentecost. Now, they didn't say it's not established on Pentecost, but it wasn't fully established. Keep in mind how they say that. What did it take? Instead, the kingdom was born or established on Pentecost, but it did not come with power and its fullness until Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. It didn't come with power on Pentecost. It just, it just came into existence. And then we had to wait till 70 A.D. for God's power. So this, teach, this doctrine teaches all New Testament references refer and apply to the following things we're talking about to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Spirit of prophecy. If you want to read more about this doctrine, that's the book. But just keep in mind as you read it what it is. Here's his quote, page 79, <clears throat> about the last days. The last days, therefore, never apply to the Christian age but always to the closing period of the Jewish age, which ran from Pentecost to the fall of Jerusalem. Spirit of Prophecy, page 79. 
the end of the world. Spirit of Prophecy, page 83. The world marked for destruction in prophecy, the end of which involved the second coming of Christ and resulted in the redemption of true Israel was the Jewish world. Therefore, it is the end of the Jewish world, not this material earth. Spirit of Prophecy, page 83. The Day of Judgment. Spirit of Prophecy, page 131. The world reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men was the Jewish world. I'm telling you, a dangerous doctrine. The second coming of Christ, the fall of Jerusalem, was the last day. You get that? We talk, we talk all through about John 5, John 6, saying that we'd be, have, be a resurrection in the last day, right? They said the last day has already occurred. The last day occurred, 87. Page 150. Well, when we think about this, Paul had to battle this doctrine. The young man read our scripture reading, but there it is. Talking about avoiding irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gang green, among them Hymenus and Philetus, who has severed from the truth, saying what? That the resurrection has already passed. What are these people saying? The resurrection's already passed. Matter of fact, it wasn't even involved in the physical body. It's only involved in the Jewish system. So what goes around comes around. We have to fight these battles again. They believed and taught that it was passed. And this is the cornerstone of the 70 A.D. doctrine. They teach that the resurrection occurred in 70 A.D. with the destruction of Jerusalem. Profane bab babbling? Yeah. Increase to more ungodliness? Yes. Overthrow the faith of some? Yes, it will. So those advancing the theory of realized eschatology believe all prophecies pertaining to the Lord's second coming, the resurrection of the dead, the judgment of the world, the end of the world, have all been fulfilled in the past. There's nothing more we have to look forward to. There's no judgment. Nothing. In their mind, we're we're in that, you know, that kingdom age. We're in, we're in, you know, we when we die now, we just like rover dead all over. The idea. With this doctrine. They've all been fulfilled in the past, specifically. 70 A.D., destruction of Jerusalem. Now, where this came from? Now, I've given you one man's name already. And here they are. C.D. Beagle. Now, not the dog, but that was just had to be his last name. He was very influential in the Ohio area particularly northern Ohio, around Youngstown, Cleveland, Akron, that area. And has a in good following of people. You'll run into people still that say, I was baptized by C.D. Beagle. And his son-in-law, Max King, they're the two really involved in this doctrine. They introduced, here's when they introduced this doctrine at a preacher's meeting. See, I told you those preacher's meetings kind of be bad, Eddie. At a preacher's meeting in Ohio, April 22nd, 1971. What, 50 years? Something like that? It's been going since then. So Max King became the leading proponent I got that mixed up one time. I was talking about Warren, Ohio, 
And I said, I said, uh, Warren King. Warren King happens to be a faithful preacher. And somehow he got a hold of that and called me up right quick. Man, what are you talking about? What am I saying? I said, oh, got the wrong king. Sorry about that. Had to, had to correct that. But Max King, got to make sure we get the right name on that. But he became the leading proponent of this. And he wrote the Spirit of Prophecy in 1971. It was updated in 2002, 784 pages worth. So I'll just give you a few quotes out of it. And then he wrote another volume, The Cross and the Parousia of Christ, in 1987. So Max King, there he is, picture of him, 1971. Relating to realized eschatology is actually a perversion of Scripture. Very, they're very critical of what they call traditional views. What we would teach about the resurrection, what we would teach about the second coming of Christ, they would call that traditional views. They're kind of like the people of Acts 17 want to hear some new thing. You know, here's a new idea, way for you to look at it kind of thing they're looking at. They expect to stimulate interest. Now, this is the way they approach people with this. They don't come out and just lay all this out, but they want to stimulate interest by a new view of the Scripture, and let's, they say, well, let's take a fresh approach to the second coming of Christ. That's the way they would start. And people being interested, like I said, a lot of young people are interested in end-time things, and people being interested, they're, they're ready to listen to this thing, and they wind up swallowing it hook, line, and sinker. Very dangerous doctrine. In the introduction, C.D. Beagle, Max's father-in-law, writes, to say this book is controversial, he says, is putting it mildly. Contention of those who supported the A.D. 70 doctrine or realized eschatology, that all, now here's, here's, get this, that all the New Testament books were written prior to 70 A.D. You believe that? All New Testament books, including Revelation. Well, let's think about that. So if that's, if that's their statement, if that's their basis, if any of the books were written after 70 A.D. and they mentioned the end of things to come, then the theory has been proved false. If we can find one book written after 70 A.D. that talks about end times, that proves this theory false. That's all it takes. It all falls like dominoes. Not the pizza now, dominoes. I had to correct that. So it must be admitted by those who support the 8070 doctrine as well as those who oppose it that the precise dating ultimately comes down to one's opinion. They have admit that. And it's supported by whatever internal and external data one has at command to assist in the matter. And so it would be arrogant on the part of anyone to base a position on the absolute certainty that every book was written prior to 70 AD. And of course, you know where I'm going with that. We know that's not the case. Here's the list. These books were written after 70 AD. So right off, that argument is proven false, that all New Testament books were written prior to 70 AD. There you go, Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. You know, we know subject of Revelation. So let's notice. So assuming that each of these books were written after 70 A.D. Then here's some scripture. 
that would deal a death blow to this doctrine. I want you to, I want you to see these. Take these down. John 14, verse 2. Notice. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Why would he need to do that? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. That one verse would strike this whole theory down. First John 2, verse 8. And now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Well, it's talking about coming. And 1 John was written well after 70 A.D. Why would he do that if he came at 70 A.D.? Through the judgment on Jerusalem. Wouldn't make sense. First John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. See how that'd be a problem with that doctrine, don't you? Jude 14, verse 14. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and all of the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That would be false according to this doctrine if this doctrine was correct. Revelation 22, 20. He who testifies these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. And then that end in the Greek is Maranatha. Come quickly, Lord. So, those advancing the theory of realized eschatology believe that all prophecies, again, the Lord's second coming, the resurrection of the dead, the judgment, the end of the world, have all been fulfilled. Now what I do with this series from here is I deal with every one of these individually. I deal with what they're teaching about these and then I show what scriptures. And that's the way I would suggest dealing with this. And then the last lesson that I do on this, and Eddie's got, these, Eddie's got these lessons if you want to see any of them, and particularly I would say get the consequence lesson, the very last lesson, because there are some consequences if this doctrine was right. One thing, why would we need to partake of the Lord's Supper if this doctrine was right? See, the, there's one problem. You get into problems about worship. You get in problems about a lot of songs we sing. Why would we sing those songs if the Lord's already come, A.D. 70, through judgment? Wouldn't make sense. It's very dangerous. Like I said, it's, it's going to all parts of the United States, and, and it'll probably be down this way one someday. I mean, it's very prominent in the, in the Midwest. So it's like, you know, when Ezekiel talking about warning people, People need to be warned about this doctrine, be on, be on guard. And, you know, once you recognize what's taught and how they teach this, you can pick up on it in conversation with somebody. We had, in Plano, Illinois, while I was there, we had a lady and her husband come in, and she introduced herself to me, and I said, 
where are you from? She said, Ohio, and I made some little remark about Ohio, you know, God's country and all that stuff, you know, just playing around. And I said, where in Ohio? She said, Warren, Ohio, which kind of, you know, kind of give me a eerie feeling. Oh, man, you know, what are we fixing to deal to here? What are we going to have going on? I said, who was your preacher? Guess who she said? Max King. So I knew where we were going, where, you know, what, was, what was about to happen. And they were, you know, they were pretty popular with the people. They were pretty social with the people. And I said, it won't take long if, you know, if people aren't indoctrinated. They're not going to teach it out here in the auditorium. They're going to go house to house, aren't they, Eddie? And teach it to individuals in your home. You know, a new way to approach the resurrection, a new way to approach the second coming. That's how it happens. And that's certainly what I was afraid was going to happen in this situation. I moved, but they were still there when I moved, so I, I don't know what happened from there. But that's, that's one thing, so that's the lesson. Maybe this is shorter than the rest of them, maybe, but I, it's just, to, like I say, an introduction, and I would study it further uh, to be ready for it. And, you know, you never know. It's something we have to watch for, just like other false doctrines that we see coming in we have to deal with. Well, God has a plan for saving man. And we notice God has given his grace, his unmerited favor. Ephesians 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Of course, we think about works. We think about three types of works. We talk about works of God, works of man, and works of the law. This is works of God. God works of God, the plan of salvation, not some work I would make up or not going back to the law of Moses for works. That's what we're talking about when we say that. And then, of course, Christ shed his blood. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. We're justified by his blood. We talked about that. We talk about that when we partake of the, the element, the fruit of the vine. How that brings us to a remembrance of the blood that Christ shed on the cross. That blood justifies us. The gospel, the Holy Spirit, revealed. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's Christ's gospel, of Christ. It's the power of God's salvation to the Jew first, also to the Greek. Sinner's faith. We talk about the uh, Philippian jailer today was told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. A beginning point. The faith. Confession with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10.10. 10. Acts 17.30. The time of this ignorance God overlooked now commands all men everywhere to repent. And then, of course, baptism. 1 Peter 3.21, even baptism doth also now save us, not the re removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. And the Christian has hope, the hope he has. You see, he said, that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. And then... We're to endure to the end. Revelation 2.10, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. 1 Corinthians 15.58, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing this, that your labor is in vain, isn't in vain in the Lord. One passage of scripture I'd like to leave you with. Psalm 5 and verse 3, a very favorite passage of mine. And it goes like this. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. You have to excuse me. I learned this in the King James Version, so that's what comes out. In the morning, O Lord, I will pray unto you and look up. Very good passage. I've seen a lot of people put that passage on their refrigerator. It's very good to remember. We start our day praying to God, and then we can look up, look to him to help us make it through the day and obey him. 
I've enjoyed being with you guys. I've enjoyed the meal. I told one of them the other night, I'm not a very good date because some a lot of things I can't eat ruin why it kind of ruins your appetite, ruins your eating, and so we, it's just very careful. But one one of the guys hit the mark, man. They took me to Pandora's, and that's one of my favorite places. I love those soups and things there. Used to go to Pandora's a lot uh, at Purdue University. Used to be able to go there a lot. Uh, I didn't take classes there, I taught, I taught there. But anyway, uh, but I enjoyed that and uh, got to see some young people there. And young people really like it and you, I think you would. I, I don't work for them now. But anyway, it worked for me. So uh, I continue to appreciate the fellowship and support you've given me ever since I was, somebody asked me earlier how long and I said, well, I know it was all the way back when I went to Mantino and I don't know how, how long that was and I know sometime I'm, slow on reports and I'll, I'll do better. And if you think it's time, don't bother me. Write me a, write me a message and say, hey, Mike, what's, what's going on? And I'll stop and get, get something out. You know, it just everything gets busy. And, but, but, I mean, it's not an excuse. I need to get them out. So uh, let me know that because you have a right to know what's going on with me, and I realize that. So it's nothing I don't realize. So. But glad to see you. So if you're subject to the invitation in any way, won't you come as together we stand for letting the song.